Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the second part of our Digital First Providers Guide that we're providing to you in terms of the various different people that can help support you and your patients in practice with Digital First Primary Care. Um, in the, feel free to check out our previous session where we covered various different providers, including Acurix, Ask My GP, eConsult, Engage Consult, Clinic, and TPP System One. But in this session, we're going to focus on three other providers. So that's Dr. Link, uh, Primary Care Pathways or Primary Care IT, um, and Patients Knows Best. And I'm uh, glad that we're joined by various of those providers, including Dr. Minal Bakai. I'm just going to add everybody to the screen now so you can all say hi. So hi to Minal, Keith from Dr. Link, Dustin from Primary Care Pathways, and Tom from PKB. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hi. So just before we get started, um, just to give you an idea of the structure of this session. So first, I'm going to hand over to Minal, who's going to talk to us about some updates from Digital First Primary Care in terms of what NHS England and stuff are doing and happening. And then we're going to go through each of the providers in turn. You'll get a chance to see their different systems and how they play and basically an opportunity to have a look, really. And then after that, we're going to answer some of the already pre-submitted questions that we've had from all of you. And then after that, you're going to have the opportunity to answer, ask and ask answer questions from the stream itself. So feel free to ask those throughout. I'll be keeping an eye on the chat myself to see how that goes. And then we'll be able to bring those questions on towards the end of the session. So feel free to comment and stuff. As I said, this is a live session, so um, we are live. It is public and everything else. But feel free, if you are watching this on the replay, to comment as well. And we'll try and answer down the line as best as we can. And stay tuned to the end because we've got the opportunity for you to get all the content from this um, directly if you need it as a summary and stuff. So first, I'm going to hand over to Minal, if that's all right. Minal? Sure. So I'm just going to share my screen. Mm-hmm. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yep, we're all up and running. Great. So uh, thanks for having me back uh, for part two. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Manal. Um, I'm a GP in Brent uh, in northwest London, and I'm deputy director in the national clinical lead for digital first primary care in NHS England and improvement. And so uh, following on from the last session, I thought I would just give a very quick update on some of the things that we've um, learnt or been doing um, since then. Um, so I'm going to just start off with um, some patient feedback. So there's been some really great emerging patient feedback um, on uh, remote consultations. And I thought I would just share some of the highlights with you. Um, and I think the key message from patients is that it's the quality of the personal communication that matters to patients um, above and beyond everything else, regardless of the modality. But things that we could look at in terms of improving the patient experience um, were about providing some clear information to patients about um, how to access services, the different modes of uh, consultation and communication that are available to them, and explaining triage. So um, sometimes the messaging has been a little bit confused for patients. Um, so while we're doing some really great innovative change uh, in the practice uh, we just need to be able to make we need to make sure that our administrative staff um, are comfortable and prepared and confident in explaining that change to patients so particularly the process of triage and that reassurance that face-to-face -face care is always available and has remained available when clinically appropriate um, and to support that, there is going to be a, a communications toolkit that will be accessible for all practices to support with, with that. And also, we have developed um, a training module for our administrative staff because the change management that's required uh, with uh, these new ways of working is not just limited to us as clinicians. Um, and so that should be published, um, hopefully, this week uh, via Health Education England. And so we can share the links uh, to that with you, too. Um, it's really clear that both clinicians and patients on the whole um, want to keep some of these new ways of working with regards to remote consulting, um, but we need to have a blended offer of communication modality. So there is no one size fits all, and it's about matching the communication approach um, and tailoring it to the person, their needs and their circumstance. Um, 
And we are doing lots of work um, around training um, and skills development because this is a new way of, of working for most people. Um, and so there is research going on in this space looking at um, how do you match um, the right cases to the right modality of, of consultation. Um, and we are working with Health Education England in developing a training programme nationally uh, that can then be offered uh, to support um, and build confidence uh, with these new uh, methods. Um, other feedback from patients um, uh, was that providing a precise time window for a phone or video call um, would be very helpful so that they would spend all day looking at their phone or missing phone calls. And I think we've heard from clinicians as well that sometimes uh, they spend a lot of time chasing patients up because of the missed calls. So, so that was something that um, you know both clinicians and patients uh, would find, I think, helpful. Um, consider, consider the patients and um, uh, confidence in using different formats of consultation and their access to technology. Um, often patients wanted a choice in whether they had a telephone or a video consultation. Um, with um, many offered a telephone, but would have preferred a video. So again, just something to consider. Uh, the other thing that, that was mentioned that links to that quality personal communication was the pace of the consultation. So uh, for it not to feel rushed, to allow time at the beginning to build rapport, uh, actively listen, space for asking questions, all the things that we would do in face-to-face -face practice. Um, and by um, providing a time window for that phone or video call, that also gives patients time to prepare so they can find a safe and private place to have the video or telephone call so that it, it's a confidential consultation. And finally, um, patients wanted to feel prepared, supported, and, and trained themselves in using this technology. So guidance and information in advance of how the consultation will work um, and so that they can feel more comfortable with how to be online. And again, nationally, we're doing there's uh, we're building on an, a national campaign that was um, released or launched during COVID called Help at Home to start providing more of those materials um, and making uh, those public messages really clear. Um, but I think, um, you know, the take home message really that I think we would all agree with is that digital is one way of providing care, but not the only way. It does not replace face to face and that digital channels should be available alongside other routes to access care, such as the telephone and in person. Um, moving on, um, we've heard um, a lot and listened a lot. Um, around digital exclusion and how to improve digital inclusion. Um, and we you know that just by uh, deploying technology, the enabling function of that technology can't be taken for granted. And we need to get that inclusive implementation process right. And of course, a lot of this was done at pace. So we, so we are really kind of optimizing where we are now. And of course, there are lots of benefits to being digitally included beyond just healthcare outcomes. Um, and some initiatives uh, that have already been developed, particularly by the Good Things Foundation, who have been a leader in this space, uh, leading the National Widening Digital Participation Programme. They've produced um, um, a website called the Digital Health Lab with lots of fantastic initiatives. So often the, the work, the projects, the evaluation has already been done. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we need to be sharing this information more broadly. Um, and then there is digital first primary care funding to support effective and inclusive implementation for practices and PCNs that's available. Uh, and that can be used to support some of these initiatives on a local level, particularly using social prescribers or digital champions to facilitate and support those that feel less confident in using this technology. Uh, and just to mention that there was free data access for NHS.UK, which uh, was really a, a very positive step forwards during the COVID period. Um, and going forwards, um, other projects in development are a people's network, which consists of um, underrepresented groups and bringing them into the conversation and making sure that we design services with their input, um, training digital champions, um, and um, building a, re a resource repository so all of this information around how to support digital inclusion and the initiatives can be found in one place um, so that it's easier to navigate. 
I'm briefly just going to show show you some of the data that we have around the utilization of online consultations and video. This is indicative data because um, uh, not all suppliers have submitted data and so there are some gaps. But as you can see, um, online consultation use has increased um, uh, yeah, since um, March. It's been on the up. But you can also see that there are very clearly defined demand patterns with Mondays and Tuesdays being highest for demand. Um, and so that can support practices with their demand and capacity modelling, because we know that we've been hearing a lot around some practices facing excess demand. And I'll come on to that in a minute. In terms of video consultations, we can see that there was a peak. Uh, actually, we can't see it quite here because it was in May and June, but you, there was a peak in May and June. Um, but as you can see that video consultation usage has slowly um, reduced um, and is now stabilized um, around uh, the 50,000 mark. Um, and that's perhaps maybe because we are starting to see more patients face to face now um, as we have left the sort of peak of the crisis. And then finally, I thought I would just show you this really interesting set of data from Devon. So I'd like to thank John McCormick, who's the CCIO in Devon, uh, for sharing this with me. Um, and as you can see, so these are the different localities in Devon where online consultations um, have increased in use. Uh, A&E attendances have actually decreased and that's statistically significant. So I think while we are talking about how we manage demand and that excess demand that we're seeing, and I think we're seeing that demand um, regardless really of the model that we're using. So practices using telephone triage are, are, are struggling as well as those that are using online consultations. I think it's um, across the board really. And we are we're facing demand from multiple uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, you know, there's a backlog of work from COVID with lots of people presenting with problems now. There is there are mental health issues uh, because of COVID that are presenting now. And of course, there's work uh, that's from secondary care, either because services aren't up and running as normal or, or back to full capacity or waiting times due to outpatient appointments. So we are managing more complexity and risk as well. Um, so I think that's all contributing. Um, what I would say is that there are we, we're trying to share learning from practices that perhaps are finding that they are managing their demand more uh, better or more effectively. Um, and we have we have um, hands on fully funded implementation support for practices to start really because we haven't had a chance to do this because of the pace that we've implemented things during COVID, but to spend some time really thinking through the implementation process um, 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 modeling our demand and capacity. So in my practice, a third of my demand comes in on a Monday. So it's about flexing the capacity uh, to, to when demand is highest. Most of the demand comes in between eight and 12 um, um, on, on weekday. So again, it's making sure that we've got capacity at the right times of day. Um, so really trying to rethink through processes, allocate work efficiently and making best use of these systems and supporting practices to do this. Um, and trying to give them the headspace and the hands-on capacity and the tools uh, to, to help them to do this. But also, as you can see from this, it's not just a general practice problem. And we uh, practices um, and commissioners should be looking at their data similar to this and working together as systems uh, to allocate resources appropriately and um, following the data and also using data from your suppliers, which I'm sure all the suppliers will talk about, to help optimize and understand that demand and capacity better and optimize and flex your capacity. Um, I, I think other things to just consider are at scale working. So uh, you know, again, um, PCNs in many areas, including where I work, have set up virtual hubs uh, so that they can support with the overflow of work, um, sharing resource and sharing workforce. And of course, those new ro roles that are coming into PCNs as well uh, will be hugely beneficial in supporting some of this. Um, so I think I will end there. If people have any questions, then um, email addresses are there. Please feel just to ping me an email and um, we'll try and help you in whatever way we can. Awesome. Thanks awesome. for that, Thanks um, I guess one question I had, uh, you mentioned about the support for implementation and stuff. How would practices access that? Is there a particular route or is that through your team or, or a different method? 
Yeah, no, so good question. So um, go through your CCG first, but if you've got any issues or, or come across any blockers, then just contact my team and we'll make sure that we put you in touch with your implementation team for your region. Cool. Okay. So thank you for that information. I know you're sticking around to help us answer some of the questions a little bit later on and, and stuff. Um, but at this point, I'm going to pass over to our th one of our three providers. So as I mentioned, we've got three different companies that are helping to support us with um, the uh, basically explaining how and what they do and how they work. So first, I'm going to introduce um, Keith Nurcombe, who's from Dr. Link. How are we doing there, Keith? Ah. You seem to have some, uh, you just muted. I'm just going to unmute. Uh, you need to. Yeah. Unmute. Sorry, there. good afternoon, everyone. I'll try that without mute. <laughs> Thanks for that. So um, I'm going to pass over to Keith. I've given him an eight minute deadline. Some of you have joined our previous um, uh, session on this, knows that I only gave the providers five minutes, which was very, very mean. Um, uh, but at least this time, they've got a little bit more time to talk about things. Uh, any questions you have, we will answer after the, the uh, all three have been had the opportunity to go through. So if you do have questions, feel free to stick it in the chat and we'll get to those shortly. I'm passing over your screen share, Keith, and it's all yours. Off you go. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I, I, I'm going to rattle through in, in sense of my eight minutes. So a little bit about Dr. Link. Uh, some of you may be familiar. You may not be familiar with Dr. Link. Um, I'm just working out now how I move my slides down. There we go. Um, so um, Dr. Link's been around for uh, four years in its current guise, but actually the algorithms uh, that we use, the clinical algorithms that we use have been around for nearly 20 years. Um, and have been used um, uh, well over 200 million times worldwide. So they're a very extensively proven, safe and reliable um, set of algorithms. Um, as you can see from a primary care point of view here in the UK, um, we offer a fully indemnified solution and that's really important for our practices. Um, but also we look after about 12 million patients in England now, which equates to about 1,500 practices now out there in England uh, and uh, Scotland, Wales, who are now using uh, Dr. Link in their everyday work, uh, which is really encouraging for us. Um, Dr. Link is very much about safety and it's a very important part of our DNA and, and using uh, a fully automated triage system, which is effectively what we are, um, it's that that safety is crucial and very, very important. So um, we, um, we are an MRHA class one approved device. We'll shortly be a class 2A approved device. Uh, we're obviously um, NHS digital approved. We're part of the, the, the GPITF and the DCS as well as the DPS. Um, and we're also ISO 27001 approved. And we have a, a process where clinical algorithms are built by clinicians. They're then externally validated by external panels around the world who validate those uh, algorithms. And then we deliver those back into the product and we use automated testing and analytics to then make sure, along with real world data, that those algorithms are as appropriate as they can be and as safe as they can be. Dr. Link as a product um, allows you to do a number of things. Um, you can see some screenshots here for an example of someone using it on a mobile phone. Um, it's available from any web enabled device, uh, tablet, phone, computer, uh, public or private. So anyone can access it uh, as openly as possible, ideally. Um, it allows you to check your symptoms. It takes people through a series of structured questions, uh, some single answers, some multiple choice. Uh, average time takes about four and a half minutes to go through the, uh, the algorithms from start to finish. Um, it then gives you what we call a disposition or guidance to the right care. So it gives you a uh, somewhere to go, a place to travel to effectively in a time frame to do that on. And then we are directly connected into EMIS system one and vision. And that allows patients to directly book a clinically appropriate time sensitive appointment based on the output of that uh, journey that they've been through the triage process and then directly book an appointment into the GP system, which frees up uh, and minimizes a huge amount of administration and reception time in dealing with those um, requests. Um, there's a variety of other things that the platform can do, obviously. Um, at, because we're fully connected, we allow that clinically appropriate uh, patient booking 24-7 into the uh, appointment book. Um, Patients can also book routine appointments, checkups, and there's a there's an algorithm process they go through to book the appropriate appointment and then either request that into the practice or um, potentially be able to book it in directly. 
Um, we allow patients to book directly currently into flu vaccination clinics, for example, at this time of year. So they don't have to ring up reception. They can go directly and book into the appropriate uh, flu vaccination clinic if they're eligible for that. Um, repeat prescription requests, um, fit and sick notes, both new and extensions. So patients can request those through Dr. Link without having to uh, uh, come into the surgery or speak to reception or potentially a clinician. And certainly now within the last three or four weeks now, we've gone live with uh, using NHS Logon for patients who are registering with Dr. Link. So um, instead of having to register specifically with Dr. Link, they can use the NHS uh, Logon process and they can use their either pre-registered details or go through the registration process as part of our product and register with NHS Login and then use that process going forward. Um, as their point of entry into Doctor Link, which is becoming very popular for patients. And that opens up an increased level of functionality for those patients as to what they can do in Doctor Link because of the way we engage with the systems. Um, all of these products are, all of these elements are what we call practice configurable. So they can be switched on and off by practices. So uh, if a practice wants to allow patients to do repeat prescriptions through Doctor Link, that's great. If they don't want to allow patients to do repeat prescriptions through Dr. Link, then if that's switched off, the patient will never see that functionality as an option. Um, and we make that configurable at a practice level because we appreciate that the way individual practices want to work and the way individual operating models work are very unique to individual practices. And it's important that you have that configurability. Um, what does the system do in terms of demand management and supporting the practice and supporting the clinician uh, and supporting the admin staff of a practice? So um, we know from uh, practices that we've now had using Dr. Link for a long period of time, we've been have practices running now for approaching three years. Uh, we can show at least a 25% reduction in demand. Um, uh, we can show that up to 50% of patients can be directed to a more appropriate channel. So that might be self-care, looking after them for themselves, and around 20% of patients will end up being recommended self-care. But actually, for lots of patients, that's being able to integrate with the local DOS, which we do, the Directory of Services, so being able to uh, send a patient directly to a sexual health clinic, for example, or send a patient directly to a minor injuries unit, rather than bringing him into the GP practice and then the GP practice having to forward them on. We're able to do that directly and we can obviously do that 24 seven, whether the practice is open or not. Um, and around only a third of the patients that come through Dr. Link actually end up needing to see the patient, uh, need to see the GP the same day, which is really important because the perception of some of these products is that it's just about creating a demand to see the GP today. Actually, only a third of the patients that go through the system um, actually need to see the GP today. The remaining two thirds that might need to see the GP will be able to see on a longer time frame. Our most common dispositions into the GP surgeries are uh, 48 hours and 72 hours, so two and three days, um, which is really, really important for our practices. We also um, add in uh, the ability for patients to use video consultation. So we have video consultation system that can be used uh, with pre-booked appointments. So booking in a, a normal appointment like you would a face-to-face -face or a telephone. Um, and we also have a video consultation product that we call rapid video consultation, which is text message initiated. Uh, the practice simply send a text message to the patient, the patient click on that. And that allows uh, patients who aren't registered with Dr. Link to use the product or uh, for the GP to decide that they'd like a consultation with a patient at short notice and be able to set that up easily and quickly without the patient needing to be a registered patient of Doxlink to be able to make use of that system. And some of our practices actually use both methods of video consultation. Uh, so they use uh, the booked one with their registered patients and they use the rapid video consultation with their unregistered patients. Um, just a final bit around support for practices. Um, uh, and I know uh, Minal uh, uh, handled that towards the end of, of her session as well. Um, Pre-COVID, obviously, we were feet on the ground delivering implementation for every single practice. Um, Post-COVID, we've not been able to do that. We do online training for all practices and staff now, but we also have materials for in-surgery, uh, digital support for practices and patients in terms of supporting patients to move over to Dr. Link. Um, we have a 24-7 help desk for both surgeries and patients uh, who are struggling uh, or need help. Uh, and obviously, we provide ongoing support and implementation and support around patient adoption and implementation for the life of the contract that we work with that surgery or CCG or STP. So there is 
ongoing support and ongoing um, uh, relationship management and support from Dr. Lee throughout the life of the, the relationship that we have with the surgery, the practice and also the CCG. Uh, I think I'll draw to a close there. I suspect that's probably about my eight minutes. Just about. And thank you for that, Keith. Um, I said I'd take questions later, but we have had one come up on the chat that's fairly specific to, to your platform. So I think I will take this one now, if that's all right. Yeah, um, cool. This is from Stickling99 on the YouTube stream. And they've said, can the admin function of booking flu clinics still be used if practices don't want to use the AI triage system? Um, yeah, let me so let me answer that. So for initially, let me be really clear. This is not an AI triage system. This does not use artificial intelligence. This is Bayesian logic. So it's really, really important that people understand the difference. It's not artificial intelligence. It's Bayesian logic. So it works in the same way that you're trained as clinicians, effectively, to continue to attempt to rule out the most significant thing you can until you reach a point at which you can't. Um, so let me just to be really clear on that because I didn't say that in my in my piece. Um, uh, practices can use the flu booking system, but they would need to be using the Dr. Link platform to be able to do that effectively. We can't just give them the functionality to book into flu clinics separated from the platform, but they don't have to have all the other functionality switched on that we discussed, obviously. Um, uh, that is configurable, but you do need the core platform there in reality to be able to register patients on it. Sure. And just very briefly as well, the same person's asked, uh, when will the local DOS be implemented in all CCGs? Um, good question. So we we integrate with uh, both DOS and MyDOS, slightly different systems used in different areas of the country. Uh, we, we, we integrate with both. It's generally a decision about working with the CCG and working with the local DOS uh, director of service uh, team and making sure that that directory of service is as appropriate as it can be, and then linking the two up. The actual linking process is incredibly fast it, because we've already mapped the outputs of Dr. Link to the directory of service, if you like, the national directory of service. It's about making sure that the endpoints are right locally so that you're directing people to the right place as best as possible. And linking to DOS is really important because it massively increases the granularity of how you can refer a patient. So it's the difference of saying, I have to refer this patient to A&E because I think they've got a broken bone versus being able to refer them to a minor injuries unit or a, um, uh, an appropriate setting that could do an x-ray but isn't A&E. When you're integrated with DOS, I can see all those systems and I can see when they're open and when they're closed. Without DOS, you lose that granularity in the system. You're looking at a much kind of simpler set of outputs. So DOS, the DOS integration is really crucial and um, it's, a, it's a piece of work to do across a whole uh, geography, but when it's done, it makes an enormous difference both to the patient and also to the practices. Cool. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for the presentation, Keith. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Tom. So just to introduce, uh, moving things around. There we go. Uh, so this is Tom Galdson, who's from Patient Knows Best. I do have a slight declaration to make here. So um, Nottinghamshire um, has uh, purchased a Patient Knows Best for the entire practice in the area of which I work in. So this is a system that we'll be using shortly in our practice. Um, so just a slight declaration there because I'm aware people may comment on that. Um, but yeah, Tom, uh, going to give you your eight minutes uh, just to answer some other questions um, very quickly. People have asked about costings, uh, questions about the costings we'll deal with once all the providers have been uh, done their presentations because it's a pre-submitted um, question. So don't worry about those. But Tom, over to you. And there's your slides. Oh, cracking. Thank you. So I'm as um, Dr. Randolph has said, I'm, I'm Tom from Patients Know Best, so I'm part of our business development team. So we look at the problem in, a, in, a, in the same way, but we look to solve it in, in, in a different way. So this is a, an image that will be familiar where you're looking at those patients that are looking at how they can access different services, those complex patients who will be seeing yourselves in primary care, as well as seeing those um, across acute organisations, tertiary care, mental health services, community services. We see this as, as kind of part of the problem to solve um, when it comes to, to digitally engaging patients and, and looking at how we can support them through um, digital pathways. So we know the, one of the ways of solving this, obviously put the patient, uh, I'll, I'll get the patient involved. So we know that there's a mass of different solutions out there focusing on uh, persisting some of those silos. So actually, rather than allowing patients to have access to the entirety of their record. There's a, a kind of portal in for them to access information through uh, GP systems. There's a focus on different transactional capabilities within an acute setting. And there's also 
a huge wealth of information that a patient is currently recording about themselves that is currently siloed away um, not accessible to those health and care professionals that are, that are treating the patient, whether that be face-to-face -face or um, virtually. So this is how we look at solving that problem. So we put the patient in the centre and we integrate information from across the health and care economy um, around them in effect. So each organisation shares a copy of data with the patient for them to have access to, for them to contribute to. So again, getting that vital, uh, valuable patient generated data, and then using that as a starting point to shift the way that care is being delivered. So again, rather than starting from actually, how can we interact with the patient service by service, we kind of change that, that dynamic, put the patient in the centre, integrate the information around them, and then look at that, that capability. So part of the work that we've done, and I'm risking it here because I'm trying a, a test environment that may or may not work, um, is that we've integrated directly into the NHS app. So patients who have an NHS app, who access the NHS app via NHS login, can register directly for Patients Know Best. But on top of that, they can, through numerous jumping off points, access other capabilities within the platform. So when we look at how patients can send and receive an asynchronous message, for example, or complete a questionnaire to, a, to enable a, a clinician or a member of the team to appropriately triage that patient. Or when it comes to actually prompting and, and pushing patients for um, to, to be in a better position to self-manage their condition. All of this is, is directly available to the patients either via the PKB platform or directly embedded within the NHS app. So this is... Uh, how PKB looks. So this is from a patient's, uh, so this is the kind of patient facing component uh, available on any web enabled device. So a patient logs in, they've got that welcome message to set the precedent for how to utilize the platform, as well as these notifications. Um, some of the features that I mentioned from a, from a kind of uh, GP orientated um, perspective, some of the, the areas that we're working closely with the team in Nottinghamshire on is how we can get patients to easily communicate with their health and care professionals, including other care collaborators, such as carers, family members, um, and others involved in their care from the voluntary sector as well. So we've got this capability to send uh, a message. So this allows the patient to pick a recipient who would be set up by, um, by the teams who, who determining which professionals to set up, which administrative teams, again, allowing the patient to pick as well those family members and other care collaborators who need this information send that subject, include a message. So again, giving some context as to, the, to the, the kind of nature of the query and then adding an attachment of up to 10 gigabytes. So this allows a patient to securely share this information, not only with, with those primary care professionals, but also those other, um, other care collaborators that that patient has in their, in their kind of network. We've also got the ability to send and receive consultations. So actually from a patient's perspective, if I'm opting to reach out for a, a consultation, these are predetermined preset, we build these on behalf of services. And um, this was in response to the total triage requirements set out by NHS England. So looking at those initial screening queries and questions, um, and then determining what information needs to be kind of shared in order for a, a professional to make a decision, including the outcome of that that consultation. So actually from a patient's perspective, what do they want to happen? So we see actually the need for that true patient held record to, to kind of sit alongside the work that is going on at the moment to, to kind of digitize the way in which patients are interacting with, with primary care. And part of that is through the ability for a patient to control who has access to which components of their record. So actually, as this patient is interacting with primary care, with the acute setting, with community services, actually being able to control who has access to which components and how that feeds into the record is a, is a key requirement. The final area, and again, you can see that it's, it's a rich platform, but I'm wary of the, the kind of time restraints. The, the kind of final area I wanted to touch upon was that area of, of kind of pushing self-management and actually equipping patients with the tools they need um, to truly understand uh, their condition and to be in a better position to, to self-manage and also to be aware of what they need to be looking out for um, as and when their, their condition begins to deteriorate. So as you can see from this care plan, patients' diagnoses pull through, medications and allergies, which are stored elsewhere within the record. And then you've got this predetermined action plan that's in place. 
So again, you can have the responsibilities and roles between the, the healthcare professional and the patient. You can include uh, media content, again, to further support that patient's understanding of their condition, including verified links, which can be local, national resources, charity-based um, resources. Again, preventing the patient looking to, to kind of Google certain uh, areas of their condition. Can include a classification and an inbuilt symptom tracker. And these can be predetermined, again, based on based on the condition of the patient and based on the, the symptomatic data that you as a, as a health and care professional are particularly interested in. And then you can set this red, amber, green uh, status or, or preemptive care plan. So actually me as a patient, if my condition begins to deteriorate, I know exactly what I need to do. But I can also just use this mechanism as a, as a means of sharing information with the patient. So it could be just to share video content, just to share additional information to ensure that actually, whilst I'm not able to see that patient, um, I can still share the information that they need as a, as a means of self-managing their their condition. The final bit I wanted to show, and this is where it gets a bit risky, is how this looks in terms of those jumping off points from the NHS app. So again, this is from a patient's perspective, their uh, NHS app account. They can go into the more section, click messages, and they jump off into PKB. So as I say, when I was talking about that, that capability to send a message or, or start a consultation, that is in effect inbuilt within the NHS app for these patients to access. So again, that send message, you get those same um, capabilities that, that existed in the, in the kind of native platform itself. And again, that ability to start a consultation and to complete that. So again, rather than adding another thing for the patient to, to, to access and utilize, actually you can ensure that not only is it consolidated in one place from across the health and care economy, which is the aim of patients know best but actually patients know they've got a single place to access this information and that is is kind of natively um within the nhs app so i think that might be my eight minutes um i'm not sure if i've gone through that pretty much quickly. bang on oh thank you no 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 you bang on eight thank you for that uh, and thank you for the presentation as well. Um, we have had a question from one of our Facebook channels. I'm just hopefully it's a quick answer. Um, but they uh, so it's, I think it's someone that's based up in Scotland and they mentioned that they don't use the NHS app up in Scotland. So is this a England focused tool, given the inspiration that you have? No. So so the the integration with the NHS app is, is just a, a kind of additional capability. So we have a previous integration with the Sky Store in Scotland. We've got the ability to. Um, capture and use the the Chi number as the primary identifier. So it's the only element that is is kind of specific to England is that integration with the NHS app. But ultimately, that capability is something that we'd look to do with any any other kind of national um, platform. So yeah, just a really good point to make it clear this isn't isn't specific to uh, to England or, or or kind of any other country for that matter. Okay. Cool. Thank you for that, Tom. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Dustin. Um, so uh, we're just going to take that off and that and that. And Dustin, would you mind sharing your screen if that's all right? Um, there we go. So and, and finally, to our, our final pro provider. So this is uh, Dr. Dustin Saint, who some of the more techie people probably know, given them he's been on the EGP Lynn pod last previously, um, where we talked about primary care pathways. Um, but I know that you're here to talk to us about One Contact, which is a, a slightly different type of platform. And mm -hmm. um, take it away, Dustin. Brilliant. Thanks so much for inviting us today. So I'll just talk a little bit about um, the two organisations that have been involved in One Contact. Some of the, some of you will know us already and some of you won't. Um, so I'm Dustin Saint. I'm a GP based in rural Norfolk um, and primary care IT is my kind of baby. Um, essentially, we just started sharing a lot of our tools that we developed within our own practice um, for EMIS um, with a lot of other practices. And that's really exploded into a really expansive tool set um, with the whole idea that every practice doesn't need to write their own searches for things like CQRS, um, doesn't need to write their own protocols for flu. Uh, actually, our organization can do that at scale um, for practices and then everybody benefits from, from those resources being available um, and they can use those within their practice. Um, so we started about four years ago and we've grown fairly rapidly to, to, to a, a large number of surgeries nationally. Um, really 
still focused on primary care. I'm still a jobbing GP for three days a week. Um, so my kind of focus is what would be useful in my practice, what would be useful for my patients, um, how can we kind of leverage simple IT to try and make it easier for people um, in their in their practices. Um, we've partnered with IATRO um, to deliver one contact. Um, IATRO have very similar values to us. Um, they are a, um, a, a a, a superb supplier um, of practice-based websites um, and practice um, intranets um, that do all sorts of fancy things. Um, they can create um, your um, privacy notice based on which tools you use within your practice automatically, um, and a whole series of other um, of other of other really neat tools. Um, all of their websites are um, compliant with the latest web standards, um, and we began discussing with them around about the beginning of COVID, um, sort of saying look we've got a lot of things that we need to do in our practice to communicate better with patients um, and we can't do it in a way that we want to do it so we would looked at a lot of other solutions on the market um, and felt that that a lot of the things that we need to contact patients for um, weren't necessarily available for us as a as a practice and through talking to iatro um, and kind of working through what we were looking to do actually we've we've come up with one contact um, and really what this what we want this to be is a, a simple way for practices just to choose which elements of care they want to try and pick off and deliver remotely for um, for their patients and for their practice um, so it's not designed to be a, a full-on um, remote consultation system it's designed to have a suite of tools that practices can look at and say well do you know what we want to take all of our sick note requests offline. Um, we don't want telephone calls about them if we can avoid them. Um, and we want to do all of those via our website. So we'll take that one bit of work and that should alleviate some pressure on our reception team. And we'll push all of that via our website. And you can do that using one contact. Um, or um, with practices, as if, if you're anything like our practice, struggling a lot at the moment with COVID, thinking how can we try and deliver care to those patients that NHS England has highlighted that we should be focusing on during COVID, um, but trying to collate as much of that information as we can remotely so that we don't either don't need to bring them into the practice to minimise their risk and risk to our staff, uh, or if we do need to bring them into practice, we can bring them in for a shorter period of time because we've got as much of that information before they come in for that review as possible. Um, so that was kind of the, the ask that we've, we've kind of come up with with one contact. Um, so what does it do? It's a remote monitoring um, and review of, pa of patients tool. Um, I'm going to take you through a guide to the process and what that looks like, um, some demonstrations of what the reviews look like, um, how you get that information back into the clinical system, um, and what other tools that we've got um, within the primary care IT tool set that then help you to evaluate those um, in your practices. So the process looks a bit like this. So number one, clinician decides that a review is needed uh, or there's an area that you as a practice feel that you want to make available for patients on your website. So that could be medication queries. It could be sick notes. It could be that you decide that you want to send out all patients who are asthmatic um, a, a review questionnaire before their, their asthma reviews come through so that you've collated all that information. It may be that you want to take all patients who are on pill checks, um, who need pill checks, and you want to send them pill check forms. It's up to your practice to kind of decide which reviews are needed and how you use them. You might do it one by one. So you might do, be doing a medication review and think this person needs a pill check, I'm going to send out a pill check form. Or you might be doing it in more of a systematic way where you you're using some of the other tools that um, that we've got that create cohorts of patients that need particular elements of care, and you might be sending out bulk messages to people to to get them to come to get them to complete those reviews. Um, you use our web interface, which generates a review code, and then the patient receives either a text message or an email uh, or your preferred method of communication with the patient um, to to be able to link to that review. You'll see from the system when we go through and I show you some screenshots, we've tried to keep it system agnostic. So you can use our system for sending the text messages, but you can also, if you prefer to use AccuRx, you can use AccuRx. If you're set up for emailing patients, you can use that. If you're using MJOG, you can use that. We've tried to keep it so that you can continue to use your normal processes if you want to. Um, we utilize the .gov notify um, text messaging service, which means that you get 25,000 text messages for free per year for your practice. 
practice. Um, if you go over that, there is a small fee for each um, for each text message, but it's much less than you pay on a commercial basis. Um, so that's the system that we use. Once the patient gets the link, they complete that review remotely, um, and then that review drops back into our um, online platform, and then the clinician or the admin person, if appropriate, decides what to pull into the clinical system. Um, and then for those practices who are using our, our um, full of suite of primary care IT tools. Um, those can actually be used to analyze those responses and to look at the, the information that's been submitted by a patient in a holistic way and think, what do I need to do for this particular patient based on the information that they've submitted? So this is the portal. Um, so you can see you've got some tabs at the top. Uh, you've got the dashboard, which takes you to this form. Um, you've got the forms themselves that you can choose to send. You've got responses coming back in, and then you've got manage one contact. So when we say manage one contact, what we mean is set up your users within your practice and then set up different teams within your practice. So for example, if you've sent, if you're sending out a form for, um, for sick note requests, you're going to want that to go to your admin team and you're going to want a group of people in that admin team who are going to be able to see those responses. Um, if you're sending out asthma reviews, you might want that those to come back to your nursing team and you want a different group of people to look at those responses. So that's where you can manage those different options. This front page has got guides to getting started and resources that you can share with your patients um, to help them um, and information for your um, for your practice newsletters and those kind of things. You can click to the forms themselves. You can see the responses. If there's a, a form that you want us to develop, if you, you can submit a request form to us um, and we can go away and work on that and then have that as um, part of the, the, the library. Um, those of you that are primary care IT subscribers already, you'll know that that's a key part of our, our reason for being. Um, we don't want you to have to go away and do that work yourselves. We want to be able to do that for you so that, so that actually this becomes a more expansive tool set and more useful for people who are using it. Um, if you've got any suggestions, so um, if you think, you know what, the hypertension um, review tool it's great but we we've had some feedback from some patients or we've got some feedback ourselves as the things you'd like to have in it let us know um, and we can build that into the process for development um, and then if you want to use iatro for um, providing your practice websites then you can um, you can get in contact with them there um, and that just means that the integration is is easier with other practice website providers we can give you the code to drop in these tools on the front end um, that's not a problem um, but if you're using iatro or practice 365 then that can automatically drop in for you so that's the portal um, and then we generate the review so we click on the forms button and you can see we've got all of these different types of forms that we can send out so asthma review pill check hrt check copd review diabetes review hypertension or raised blood pressure learning disability health check heart failure review options so do you want to send it using our system with gov.notify uh, or are you using Acurex, um, iPlato or MJOG and then you can copy and paste that link into into one of those messaging systems and then send that remote form out. Um, if you want to send a larger number of, um, of, um, of requests, then you can copy and paste a phone number list from, um, from searches within EMIS, and we can provide you with those searches. Um, and then you can post those into the phone there and then send out that link in that way. So there's two different ways of sending out that link to individual patients or to cohorts of patients. So this is the asthma review. I'm just gonna play the video here. So this, this just guides us and walks us through an asthma review. So this is the patient view. So it just gets the patient to confirm that actually they are taking their inhalers for asthma. Um, one of the early bits of feedback was that sometimes people are taking asthma um, inhalers for other things. There's some hints and tips for them about what to do to prepare for their review and what to, um, to think about in terms of the answers during their review. Um, we have a narrative um, to describe how, how the asthma has been since the last review. We asked them to, um, to score um, how they feel their asthma control has been. Um, and then we and go through we collect all of our um, the asthma control test questions so all of the stuff that you need for um, for quaff for this year um, we can collate all of that information remotely the form goes through and calculates the asthma control test score um, at the bottom um, so you can see that there um, that pulls can pull back through when we've got the integration sorted with the clinical systems that will pull back through as coded data which will be able to drop drop in um, so you can see it asks you if, it, if your asthma is worse when you're at work if it is it asks you to give more details about that if it's not um, then 
that box doesn't show up. So in the same way, if, for those of you that have seen our templates within the clinical systems, you'll know that they're very dynamic and they show you exactly what you need for that particular patient. This is the same with these, with these reviews. We've built these to be gold standard reviews that will go through everything that you would expect a patient to go through with one of your nurses if they were coming in for a really good quality asthma review within the practice. Um, and we've tried to phrase the language which kind of gives patients permission to actually tell you the truth rather than um, the kind of um, you are taking your inhalers regularly, aren't you, kind of thing. It's um, We expect that people forget to take their inhalers. Uh, how often is this a problem for you? So it's kind of trying to, to get that. You can see we collect peak flow information. It then even feeds through to give you the, the numbers that they need to watch for. Um, that, of course, if you're using our primary care IT tool set, um, will cross-populate into a care plan, which you can then send back to the patient as well. Um, so I think you probably get the idea of the asthma one. I'm not going to linger on that for too much longer. Um, because just we, a reminder we're going to run out of time otherwise. Yeah, yeah. no, that's fine. Diabetes, I'll, I'll skip through that one. Um, so we've got admin tools. We've got the sick note um, or paperwork for completion. So again, if you wanted to pop this onto the front end of your website, um, you can use that for fit note requests, uh, sick note requests, um, how long have you been unwell for. If it's for less than seven days, actually it flags that you shouldn't be requesting a sick note and gives you the, the .gov website, asks you if you've had sick notes before, um, and if you have... Um, then it says how have you been getting on since you had your last sick note so you can see it's really kind of giving a bit of a narrative as to as to what's going on medication cruise is the other one these are the responses as they come back in so you click on the responses and you can see those coming back into to the, to the system um, this is still work in development at the moment um, it's not as pretty as we want um, and it's something that before so this is a very early product and we're just about to go live with it um, this will um, when we've got the integration sorted, you'll be able to select each of these um, codes and they will pull across into the clinical system, um, meaning that for things like your asthma control test questionnaire or your CAT score for CAPD, you're not going to be having to put that in manually. You'll just be able to literally tick on the box on the left-hand side, tick on add to clinical record, and it will drop across into the clinical record. And then just to finish up, because I'm conscious of time, this is then the kind of tools that we've got built into the clinical system that will then give you a summary of the information that's just been um, collated on the, the remote review. So it pulls in not only the information that's just been put in on the review, but also information from the clinical record. So this one tells me diagnosed COPD July 2013, tick because they're not currently smoking, their gold two, their COPD group D, their MRC was five, they've had zero exacerbations, examinations, that's a bug we need to sort out. Um, and then you've got information about chest x-ray, BMI, SATs, and all those kind of things, inhalers and nebulizers, vaccinations, and then whether they've had pulmonary rehabilitation. So the whole idea is that that makes it as seamless as possible to try and get that information and then decide what you want to do about it. Awesome. And I think that's probably slightightly over time Dr Gandalf <laughs> sorry about just that a little bit yeah um, um, so yeah I'm just gonna bring everybody else back onto the stream if that's okay and what we're gonna do is I've asked um, the providers a few prerequisite questions which we're just going to quickly wing through so um, as part of the digital first providers guide this is a similar format to what we did for our first one and if you do want to check that out feel free to do so the link is there as you can see EGP learning DFPG. Um, but effectively, what we asked was um, these three key questions at the start. So which systems uh, that each of these platforms integrated with? And as you can see, all three providers do integrate with EMIS and TPP system one. And Dr. Link also does integrate with Vision. Um, we did ask the question about cost. Now, I appreciate that this is sometimes a challenging question for many providers to answer because there is always the element of cost, maybe depending on which services you use. Um, but roughly estimating it for a 10,000 patient population per year. Um, and as you can see, the values are there um, and, and stuff. And obviously, the company providers are more than happy to go into more details about costs and stuff if you wanted to contact them. I guess the other thing that was interesting to know is the patient drop off rate as well. So we know that when patients engage with online systems in particular, that they may not complete the journey of that. Uh, and um, as you can see, we've got information as to each of the providers, what they, they estimate their, their, their rough ideas to be. For some deeper answers, uh, so sorry, for some deeper questions, we also asked a couple of things previously, which are, have been quite well received and, and useful questions. And I guess uh, the key one that I had, which I'm gonna ask each of the providers in turn, 
Um, so if I can ask for a brief answer, just mindful of time. Um, but how would you uh, support and ensure that you're helping the have-nots of society, so those patients with, for example, without mobile internet device, you know, those kind of things. How will you help those members of our populations? So uh, I'm going to go in turn order again. So if I can go first to Keith briefly. Uh, yes, brief as possible. So we appreciate not everyone has uh, access to a web-enabled device. Uh, we do support NHS England Total Triage. So anyone in the practice, uh, reception or admin, can take a patient through the Doctor Link product, uh, uh, through the questions and to an output without the need for the patient to be able to directly engage. So we hope that allows patients who don't have any form of web-enabled device to at least be able to use the product and for the practice to move patients through the product in the same way. Cool. Tom? So from our end, it's ensuring that you've got carer family member access so they can interact digitally on behalf of those who, who, who aren't able to. And then obviously with it being web browser access rather than app, you can access it on a, a kind of publicly available um, device. So a local library computer or a, a borrowed device. Um, and two other things, integrating with things like screen readers and other plugins to increase accessibility. I know that's not really a kind of have not society, but another kind of hard to reach group. And again, uh, having the hard coded components of the solution translated into uh, over 20 languages. Mm -hmm. And where accessibility is a big topic, particularly with some of the website changes that are due to come in and force at the end of this month. So clearly that's useful. Um, and Dustin. So our tools are really designed to fit into business as usual processes for, for practices for people who are digitally enabled because a lot of the remote reviews that we're sending out, we're generating the searches to identify those cohorts of patients. We know which patients haven't got mobile phones. We know which patients haven't got email addresses um, and we can make sure that those searches identify those patients and practices can then approach them in a, in a, in a, in a business as usual way for those, those particular groups of patients. So it's about, it's about kind of enhancing what you can um, at the same same time as, as as identifying which patients you need to take a slightly different approach for. Cool. Next question we had was how do you support mm -hmm. and provide engagement with your customers, i.e. the practices? So again, if I can go to Keith first. Um, so we have uh, feet on the ground implementation. So we have every practice that we work with will have a dedicated account manager whose responsibility in, in a pre-COVID world, face-to-face, -face, in a current COVID world, remotely, obviously, uh, but in a face-to-face -face way. So they have responsibility for supporting the practice, embedding the product, helping uh, deal with the configurability questions and uh, also supporting those practices around patient adoption, as we would call it, or bringing patients into the product and uh, supporting them and managing them through that journey. And that's for the life of the contract. So uh, they will be there to support that, uh, those practice and practices. And it's usually a dedicated individual within each CCG. So there's continuity across uh, multiple practices and the same messages inside the same CG and the same. So uh, that's how we deliver as much support as we can to the practice. Sure, Tom? Uh, so we provide unlimited support to practices. So all kind of deployment activities, training, maintenance of the solution, hosting, configuration, all is, is in kind of adoption of a platform is all covered as well as first line help desk support. So again, providing as much support as possible to practices throughout the, the kind of duration of the contract. And um, Dustin? Because uh, our solution is really quite intuitive um, and because it's got such a low cost acquisition, we provide the usual support that you'd expect for, for, for an IT solution in terms of online digital ticketing systems by phone, by email, by social media. Um, we tend to do a lot of the training um, by videos um, with, with um, kind of web webinars to highlight what um, how practices can get up and running with them. Um, but we try and be slim and slick and clever about how we deliver things because our, 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 what we want to have is a tool that is really easily accessible for practices and really handy for practices to just work at the bits of areas that they want to work at. Um, so we've tried to keep it uh, keep the cost down, but, but equally that doesn't come with such a broad suite of supporting resources as you might get with a fuller solution. Okay. And the final deeper question we had is, what patient support media do you offer practices when they're starting out with your platform? Because particularly I can appreciate onboarding right now is a, a bit more challenging since the face-to-face -face element is a bit more tricky. Um, so again, Keith. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so we work with the practices. So we provide uh, digital. Uh, we provide in practice advertising for the for the product and, and why to use it. Clearly, that's a little limited at the moment for obvious reasons. We replicate that digitally. We support the practice with putting banners on websites and, and helping them with their website. We also have pre-configured content around emails, text messaging, all of that that the practice can make use of, and uh, IVR systems on the telephone. So uh, there's as much support as we can in terms of helping them communicate and talk to their patients and we obviously work hand in glove with ccgs and their own comms teams in terms of how they want the how they want this to look across a wide section of practices so working in conjunction with them and providing support um, across either an individual practice or, or a larger group of practices at a ccg or an sdp level okay tom uh, we provide uh, online manual covering all aspects of the, the solution, as well as kind of embedded guidance uh, resources that are tailored to the services and the, the configuration that those services have of, of PKB. Got a full comms toolkit, so posters, social media, um, posts, roller banners, which again, we can we can share kind of best practice from other organizations and, and get those tailored. Um, we publish a lot of educational videos as well on, on our website. So actually within that manual as well as, as, as kind of publicly. Um, and then we provide help desk support as well. So actually we'll pick up the phone to, to, to patients if there are particular queries or questions or, or concerns. Okay. Um, cool, and Dustin, finally. Uh, so we've got all of the all of the above mentioned things really, information for practice websites, um, pre-created pros for practice newsletters, uh, video guides, um, and all of those kind of things. So a full a full kind of com suite for you to be able to go out to your patients about about the resources. Cool. Okay. Um, thank you everybody for that. Uh, so I'm aware we're hitting time. I'm, I'm going to continue for a little bit longer because I know we've had a couple of extra questions. But just before we did that, I did want to mention to everyone that we have got a further event planned for the end of this month on the 30th of September, which is headlined by um, both uh, Dr. Minal Bakai, who's with us today, but also with Dr. Nikki Nakani talking about the future of primary care. So you'll definitely want to join us for that. And various other providers we talk about digital primary care for our conference on the 30th of September. If you're interested in joining, feel free to use the link below. Um, if you do want all the detailed question, answers to the questions that each of the providers have given us, simply just hold your phone up to that screen and you will be sent straight to the link that gives you the option of giving us um, some feedback. And when you do that, you'll get the link to the um, full document that has all the answers in detail and also contact details for each of the provider, or you can type in the link that you can see there. Um, we did have a few extra questions that came in. Um, and I, the first one I'm actually gonna ask to Minal, if that's all right, um, just because it's a, a quite a topical one, I think that many people are um, struggling with right now. So we mentioned about the challenges with demand in particular. And um, it's not actually come from the stream. It's, it's someone's WhatsApp me this because they're not being able to ask it on the stream. Um, but simply they were asking, it, will practices have the option of actually switching off their digital triage systems during the out of hours period, given the fact the demand is so high right now? And obviously we're about to hit the winter period. Uh, their feeling was that obviously things like PCNs and, and, and networks effectively haven't had the opportunity to fully mature and the additional roles to become fully online yet. And clearly quite anxious about the coming winter period. Um, any thoughts on that at all, Mina? Yes, and I, and I think this is a challenge, isn't it? Um, so I guess there are there are um, the downside to, to switching off the system is obviously confusing messaging for patients and it impacting on the patient experience. So one of the, the benefits of online consultations is that patients can complete a consultation in their own time um, and take time to do that. And it doesn't revolve around uh, service availability hours, uh, which can help uh, reduce some of the traditional barriers that some people have had to accessing general practice. You know, particularly uh, carers, people that are working, for example. Um, but equally, uh, we recognise that um, you know demand is high, and and this is quite an atypical situation. You know, pre-COVID. Um, demand was stable, relatively stable and predictable. Um, so um, there, there is no national um, mandate to say that you can't switch off your system. I think it's worth having a conversation with your commissioner and your PCNs um, to, to discuss uh, strategies and how you manage that demand. 
But if it's felt that that's the most appropriate and safe thing to do, then suppliers should support practices and or CCGs in being able to switch off the system during, you know, week on weekends or um, outside of practice hours. But make sure that that messaging is really clear to patients about how to access care then if they do need it. Um, I, I guess one of the issues is that we're often pushing demand to the rest of the system and it, and it just keeps circulating it and it and therefore it does impact on the patient's experience because we know that it's a difficult system for them to navigate so I think it's about having that system-wide conversation but appreciate that um, you know we want to make sure services are safe and sustainable as well cool. I hope that answers the question so it's not a no but it's a you know think think about the, the right solutions for your patient population sure and I'm aware this is a similar question to what we had the first time around when we did the Digital First Providers Guide, but I appreciate people may not have seen the answer to this. So um, how can practices change provider if their CCG has already chosen something that they feel doesn't work for them? Yes. Um, so uh, I guess two things there. So the contracts that were set up as part of the COVID response were short contracts. So they will shortly be coming up for renewal. Um, and uh, we are... Um, you know, we've, we've produced this functionality matrix that I think you mentioned earlier that will be published soon to outline some of the, the, the kind of more detailed functionality that each of the supply systems offer. In addition to that, we're doing lots of evaluation around the accessibility and usability of each of the systems that will be published alongside um, a wider published set of data looking at the impact of, of different digital first pathways um, alongside the research an evaluation that's happening around digital um, more broadly and you know who where it works where it doesn't uh, what, what the benefits are so hopefully that will provide information to support commissioners and practices and, and patient uh, um, PCNs in investing in the right solutions for their local um, population and their practice needs um, but uh, if you I guess the key message is is that um, if your if your commissioner is already in contract with a supplier, um, then practices will need to speak to their commissioner about using um, a different system because uh, there needs to be a discussion about who will pay for that system because all of the digital first money has now been uh, provided to uh, to the commissioner for spending on the um, on products. Um, and so if uh, the commissioner agrees, then there will need to be a discussion about the contract, looking at the contract arrangements, variations in contracts, so that contract management discussion. But of course, as soon as that contract comes up for re-procurement, um, then um, it, it's good to be in a, in a kind of a prepared place where there's the engagement has happened and commissioners are clear about the different solutions that might be um, appropriate. And I think perhaps just to add, again, uh, commissioners can commission more than one product for their area. So it's, again, no mandate that you can only have one product, but we are encouraging um, that kind of more informed approach to what products are used um, within, an, within a local area. Sure. And I guess to um, uh, expand on that a little bit, I guess um, one of the key things is that the practice still have the choice of going to another provider if they wanted to, but obviously potentially paying for that themselves if they felt that was a better option um, there's nothing to prevent people from having I guess a suite of options obviously not every platform does everything um, or everything that practice may want or anything that the patient may want so you know there is potentially the option of mix and matching and I guess not to underestimate the element of onboarding that is required not only for the practice but also for the patients as well I guess that's a key thing to be aware of that you know if you were to be changing regularly that's going to have a significant amount of change management um, implications and drain and let's be clear many of us are probably quite drained out as it is with change management over the past six months so being aware that that's not probably a great place to be having to do that over and over again and i guess just to add to that that if a practice does directly procure then they take on um a lot of the responsibilities that their commissioner would traditionally take on particularly mm -hmm. around the clinical safety risk assessments and the the dpias um and while we have produced resources to support that is quite a large undertaking and then they will be responsible for managing the contract and the supplier so i think we we feel that the, the best way to do this is through your commissioner but 
uh, Commission is really engaging with practices and PCNs to support them in, in procuring the right solutions that they need, but taking on some of that risk um, and management to reduce burden on practices. Cool. Um, so we've had a rather interesting question, which I've not seen before. Um, so I'm going to ask this to everybody. Um, so would any of the platforms allow me to author my own content? And if not, what is the cost to implement changes? I must admit, I've never seen that question before. So hence why I'm asking it. <laughs> I'm happy to, to go first. So from a, from a PKB perspective, yes. So we're... Um, we're really keen that actually in terms of that clinical content that is provided to a patient that is completely tailored by by those that are, are, are treating the patient in effect so we'd look for that content to be authored um by by health and care professionals and in terms of the cost um that that's part and parcel of, of how we deploy pkb so that would be covered as, as kind of part and parcel of our software as a service license and that would include the tailoring of all of those kind of care plan capabilities as well as consultations as well as those web links um, in terms of those those configurable resources, that, that that's all kind of part and parcel of what we do. Cool, um, Dustin. Since you're next on the screen. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, we've already done this with um, with one contact in northeast London, looking at heart failure. Um, they had some excellent local resources. Um, we were able to build that out in one contact, um, and then the practices in that region have been able to use one contact to be able to manage their heart failure patients remotely. So, so we're really keen to 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 um, have have other people's content to be able to look at and think how can we best structure that with what we're doing the key thing around this is clinical safety and making sure that actually the the, the content that's being submitted to us is correct and that we've clinically assured it and that it's been through our internal processes so we'd, we'd of course want to do that um no there wouldn't be any cost to that that's just part of our business as usual okay thank you um so um our algorithms are built based on best practice from all elements of, uh, of, of practice. So that's guidelines, RGCP, um, NICE. So, but we do take feedback from, from general practitioners and clinicians all the time and we value that feedback in. So absolutely, we'd love feedback and views and opinions in, but we can't alter the appearance and the content for one uh, practice versus another because the algorithm set wouldn't be able to work in that way so it's a more universal approach but we do value the input and the feedback absolutely uh, in the process because that's how we build the best set of algorithms that we can sure okay there was a follow-on question to that about who would own the ip i'd probably say that as the discussion between the person and the company to be honest but um i don't think i'm gonna ask that particular one to everybody just yet um just before we finish off we did have a question actually for dustin and i appreciate you didn't get the chance to show you this one so um has a remote reviews reduced appointments um, and demand and does it work with EMIS? I know you've answered that quite the latter part, but the first one, uh, I guess, would be interesting to know, yeah. have you seen impact on demand? Yeah, so we've been so we've been running asthma reviews in in our practice for the last three months or so, and of the of the reviews that we've sent out, there's about three quarters of them that have been completed remotely um, without the need for any further prompting. Um, and of those three quarters, there's about three quarters of those that the patients have felt um, they that was sufficient to complete the review without needing to come into the practice. Um, of those, about. 10% of our practice nurses have felt actually did need to have some form of review. Um, but that is a fairly large kind of cohort of patients that actually have been able to be managed remotely. Um, so it's had quite an impact on, um, on, on appointment availability. Thank you for that. And thank you, everybody, for your time. I appreciate that we've gone a little bit over. It inevitably always happens, I'm afraid, because we like to get into the questions and stuff. Um, if anybody does have any questions, feel free to put them in the, the comments down below. We'll try. I'll try my best to answer those as time goes on. Um, if you do want to leave us your feedback, as I said, you'll get the contact details as well as the full detail of the answers from all the providers that have been talking, um, and as well as their contact details are in there as well. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you everybody for joining us and make sure you catch us on the next time when we go through this in more detail for you again. And as always, YouTube Lane is here to save you and your patient's time by taking hands in primary care and learning.